this is Duke University. You name the continent and I'll tell you what we're doing there. This is in no small part thanks to the person who is about to take the stage and maybe you would just slowly take the stage and sit in the far chair. That will avoid difficulties later. Okay, so this person is Mike Merson, uh, uh, the, the director of our Global Health Institute. I'll just tell you a little about his life. He went to Amherst, uh, and if you want to know the, what the secret vanity of Mike Merson is, that he was a basketball star at Amherst. Uh, and he actually played in the Maccabean games. And when he came to Duke, he asked if I would please try to interest Coach K in this phenomenon. Uh, and Mike, I want to tell you, I have told Coach K twice about this, uh, but he has yet to rise to the bait. Okay. <laughs> Am I going to try it a third time? I don't know. Uh, then you went to medical school at Downstate in New York. Then you went to Hopkins, right? You did your internship and your residence at Hopkins. Uh, and since then, he's had an extraordinary succession of jobs. He worked at the Center for Disease Control. Uh, he uh, worked in Bangladesh on cholera, which is something that, I spoke, that, that suddenly, uh, alas, has a renewed interest for us now. He went to work at the World Health Organization, where he became the leader in all the diseases that have di uh, diarrhea as their pre uh, presenting symptom. Uh, when he was at WHO is when AIDS came into existence as a scourge around the world. Uh, and so Mike Merson was asked to lead the coordination of the global response to HIV AIDS uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. From there, he went to Yale, where he was the dean of the School of Epidemiology and Public Health, and where he and I were colleagues. And when I went to Duke, in my inaugural address, I said Duke would be a great place to do global health because you had a business school that specialized in health sector management, an engineering school that specialized in biomedical engineering, a divinity school uh, that worked in countries around the world, and of course, many uh, uh, health leaders are faith leaders around the world, uh, a medical school, nursing school, public policy, all the dimensions, but you know, when I said this, I did not really expect it to happen, uh, but you know, at Duke, that's what happens if you have to watch what you say at Duke. Uh, and so uh, it was, colleagues got together, they devised a program, we ran a search, and Mike then left Yale and came to Duke. Uh, since that time, I will tell you, uh, if you haven't met him yet, uh, you, will, you will find he has certain traits. One, an immense curiosity, mention any subject in health, and he just knows all about it, an incredible passion for his subject. Uh, but but also something else, he is really the ideal person who plays well with others. Uh, uh, it, 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 global Health at Duke was never going to be about having your own empire. It was always going to be about uh, doing something so fun on the playground that everybody would come and play with you. And indeed, that's what, that, what, has, really, uh, what has really happened. And then just incredible entrepreneurial instincts. Uh, every time I see you, something is new. Uh, so I see you one day, the first uh, certificate program Duke ever offered abroad was a program in global health that was offered in Beijing by your colleagues. I met them in the airport coming home. Uh, what I, I saw you last time, uh, the Gates Foundation has given a huge grant to ABC News to do a year's worth of broadcasting about global health issues, so Duke was contracted uh, to be the, uh, the consultant about the content for that show. Uh, this, you know, uh, an entrepreneurial person you are the leaven in the loaf. You just make it all rise, and you make, uh, you make things happen. Uh, so what we're going to do at this point is uh, I am going, I hope I didn't sever my life uh, connection here. Uh, I am now going to uh, amble over toward my chair. Hello. Hi, Mike. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. <laughs> Good to be in your office again. Je jellyfish and all. <laughs> Okay, I, uh, I'm just going to ask Mike some questions, and there'll be questions such as you might have wanted to ask, and so I'll save you the time and trouble, uh, and then we'll throw it open, and then you can ask him what you really wanted to ask him. Okay, so Mike, uh, uh, I'm going to guess that when you were young, your mother hoped you would be a doctor, uh, and it came to pass, <laughs> but I'm going to guess that she didn't really visualize the kind of doctor you would become. Com so how did that happen? Right on both occasions. Okay. Uh, She's, I, not, she's not in Baltimore, is she? No. I think that's an interesting question because it's a, a lot of the students who come to Duke uh, come to Duke thinking they may go to medical school mm -hmm. and don't go to medical school. Many more don't go to medical school than do go to medical school. I think what happened to me is that in my medical school training, 
I became to realize that um, it wasn't just disease that was important. Of course, making people healthier was important. But the reason for the disease, why were people getting sick? Uh, what were the determinants of illness? Uh, I, I happened to train, as you heard, in, in uh, went to medical school in Brooklyn. And there was, in those days, it was really tough. I, I went here in East Baltimore, uh, and I was a resident here at Hopkins. And you saw people really facing terrible health disparities. And so I developed a, a passion very much uh, for trying to understand more about why people got sick and what we could do about that, not just treating them. And in fact, I think I've now learned over many years that the, the, if you look at our history in medicine, uh, a lot more has been gained in prevention uh, than in treatment. Although we spend most of our healthcare dollar on, on treatment, around, not just in the United States, but around the world. Uh, I think having a liberal arts education played a role in that. And I think eventually, Dick, my, my parents came to accept it, but it took a while. So what did you first do internationally? How did it take on this global dimension? I mean, I'll come back to the fact that so far global health has included Brooklyn and East Baltimore. Well, yeah, I mean, it's oh, yeah, interesting because yes, those correct. are part of the globe as well. That's right. 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 Uh, I got into global health originally, I think my first experience was actually in 1969. Uh, when a professor of uh, obstetrics and gynecology asked me if I wanted to spend the summer, like a lot of Duke students, you get sort of an opportunity to go abroad. Uh, and of course, in those days, going abroad meant six flights to get to India. Uh, but, and there was no email, remember, and, um, and the phone call took about four days to book if you wanted to make an international phone call. Some of you were smiling, so you know what I mean. But I actually went to Nepal. Others in this room have no idea. <laughs> right. Go ahead. So I went to Nepal, actually, um, and I went on a USAID fellowship. And I worked in the, uh, in the Nepal Family Planning Association uh, and did two things. Uh, I, I went out there primarily to learn more about why women were, were uh, not using contraceptives and, and what, were the, what better options would be used. And then I had an opportunity uh, to go up in the mountains a little bit and do vasectomies. Now remember, I'm a third year medical student now. Uh, and I, you probably couldn't do that now. And I, and I did that uh, on Gurkha soldiers. And uh, now, you, you know, what, that's a very, that's an experience I still remember. Uh, and and uh, because it was such a, uh, spending your first time abroad in a foreign country, getting to know the people, getting to understand them not knowing their language, which is a challenge, and particularly dealing with a sensitive topic of, of family planning, in this case, both in women and in men. And, and I was quite impressed, even in those days, that men understood and wanted to have vasectomies as a way of, um, of not having children. So that was my first experience of many experiences. Um, but that first one, I think many of you uh, who have been in global health know that first experience is something you never forget. So that was mine. Well, uh, yeah, we, we don't have a big summer vasectomy program uh, <laughs> for students <laughs> yet, uh, though I suppose we Not could yet, consider no. it. Uh, but let me ask you, I mean, I, kn I know your career involves going back and forth all right. kinds of places, uh, but then, you know, of course, Nepal and Calcutta are far apart from each other, but you then went back to the subcontinent and worked right. in cholera. Uh, and when I mentioned cholera before in my introduction, of course, I saw lots of people's faces light right. up. So. So what I did is um, I, I, I actually, uh, after my training here at Hopkins, uh, I um, went to the Center for Disease Control um, and uh, ran the enteric diseases branch, uh, diarrheal diseases branch, and had an opportunity there, a number of opportunities. One of them was to um, investigate cholera uh, when it came to Guam, which was the first time it hit American soil in many years. Uh, but, then, but then after my uh, time at CDC, I went back to training actually here at Hopkins and uh, some in Boston, but particularly here at Hopkins, and, and uh, the Hopkins had a long history of working in cholera. You may not know that, but some of the early great experiments in cholera were done by Hopkins doctors working in Calcutta and in Dhaka, Bangladesh. I went out to Dhaka, Bangladesh, used to treat uh, 1,000 cholera patients a day and really uh, learned a lot about that disease and, um, and uh, spent two years living in Bangladesh uh, and got to know the country very well. And then um, after that, I decided that I was not going to go into clinical medicine and, and uh, went to the World Health Organization, as you heard, in 1978. I thought I would only go for two years. 
I, I went to Bangladesh for two, I went to Geneva for two years, and as you heard from Dick, I uh, stayed 17 years. Uh, and I really enjoyed the opportunity to visit, you know, my home was really Swiss Air 16B, and, and so, uh, visit a lot of countries. So it raises an interesting question for me. So you've worked global health your whole career, but you've worked it in different institutional settings, right? So you've worked it on site, in Bangladesh and elsewhere. Then you went to work for a, a gigantic transnational uh, uh, institution, bureaucracy, whatever you'd call it. Either and then, one. And then later you went uh, to work in a university, but a university was almost your last home. It wasn't right. your first. Uh, so uh, I'd just be interested in you talking about what was the, uh, the sort of value for you, the education for you about the different sort of settings of global health kind of work. Actually, I've thought about that question a lot because a lot of people usually, the more common theme would be that the more common path would start in academia. And then as you get older, you, you, wanna, you, you, you go overseas or you work with a, an NGO or you work with a UN organization. I actually, for me, it was in reverse. But I think what that did for me is when I came into academia, uh, at, first at Yale and, and here at Duke, I was able to bring with me the understanding uh, of, the, of the world in terms of health. And I was able to, um, I think, for students in particular in designing courses, for designing our research programs, for recruiting faculty, I, I searched for um, an understanding. Of course, we, the, the primary goal in a university is knowledge. That's why we're here. We're here as universities to learn and to teach others. But I think having had that years of practical experience in the field, and understanding the way the governance of global health works in the UN system and bringing that into the academic setting, um, I felt that was something that we, we've been able to do, particularly at Duke, where we have a lot of students who are not only interested in the facts, but they're interested in how to change things. And they are sometimes very frustrated by the governance of the UN system or the way you, um, our own um, foreign aid works or the way uh, non-governmental organizations, which, which also have problems working. Uh, so, so for me, it, I, I think it was a, a great path to follow. Well, I'll just boast of you uh, and tell a story because the people in this room won't know it to be true, which is the benefit of the, of the trajectory you took is you really do bring a knowledge of the world, not in some generalized way, but really all kinds of very specific knowledge. And I remember the first year you were at Duke, there, uh, many of you will remember that what, there was a great women's, a member of the women's basketball team named Emily yeah. Weiner, who of course was pre-med, what could be more natural, uh, and especially interested in respiratory diseases right. in highlands of Central America. Right. Uh, so she had one program in mind, but then she went to visit you, but you knew the actual person she should go work with. Right. Uh, and she did, and now she is a student, a uh, medical student, student, actually pursuing a global health track at Duke. Uh, so, but, but let me ask you, so now, of course, we, I've been, uh, n not being a total chauvinist, uh, have not been waving the Duke flag too much, uh, but now we come to the moment in your career when you've done, the, you'd done uh, Bangladesh, you've done the CDC, you've done the WHO, you'd gone to academia, but then you chose to come to Duke. And I'd just be interested in sort of what did you see as the specific meaning of Duke as a place of promise for global health? Well, I think you said a lot of that uh, on the podium. and. Uh... So remember, I didn't know Duke until four years ago. And so many, you know, and so you get a call to come look at a job. And I had just stepped down at, at Dean, very upset, of course, that uh, President Broadhead had left us. But, you know, you, you, uh, you come and I, I actually, so global, hot's a hot, global health is a hot topic now. I'm sure many of you know that. There are close to at least 100 universities in the world, in the US alone that are building programs in global health. So I get, I, I get a call to take a look at, at Duke. So I came down and, and what was so striking to me is that everybody I met said to me, this is a special place. You can really do global health here because people really t like each other. People talk to each other across schools. Remember I had been at Yale where sometimes you needed a visa to go from school to school. And, and it's not quite like Harvard, but it, it has, there's brilliant people at Yale, don't, don't take it the wrong way, but it, in terms of the ability to bring departments, schools, faculty together, people told me that, and for any, more than anything else, that's what sold me in coming to Duke. Because if we were gonna build a global health institute, 
that the plan was to bring all of a university to address the problem. And going back to what I said before, of course, medicine is critical to that. But, but all the schools at Duke, and the way it was presented to me is, let's show what a university can do. Not just part of a university, but a, all a university to reduce health disparities in the world. And so I, I heard it enough times that I, I believed it. And uh, I can tell you that it's true. And uh, I now have colleagues, including here at Hopkins, who are running global health centers, global health programs, global health institutes, some of them very good. But we are really special that we have an institute that is, truly brings all of the university. And I attribute that to the leadership of the university, the history of the university, the culture of the university, and many of the things that I allegedly have achieved really were hanging fruit. And I'd say one more thing, Dick, that um, when I'm asked, so when you, when you arrive, at Duke, what was so striking besides this friendliness and, and ability to collaborate? And I would say the students. And I'll just tell a little story. Dick's heard it before. But on the 14th day, 13th day I was here at Duke. He means there. I mean there. <laughs> at the thir I'm in your office. On the 13th day I was at Duke, there's an, I open up the, um, the newspaper. Okay? And I see myself as an editorial. And th I've been at Duke 13 days. And the editorial says, what has Merson done? Okay? And it's a scathing editorial that I've been there for 13 days and the students have seen no change. Okay? So I email Provost Lang. It was pretty dismaying, I admit. <laughs> I email Provost Lang and I say, Peter, Peter is his first name, Peter, what is this? What have you set me up for? And he said, welcome to Duke. But it's a story that I remember very well because a lot of what we've been able to do, particularly on the education side, has been driven by the students, by the passion of the students right. and by the desire of the students who I think this generation has a great passion for service, uh, for making a difference in the world, which of course is the, what our university's uh, strategic plan is called, making a difference. And I think that, that to me is the other striking part of Duke is the great enthusiasm of the students uh, and they really mean it. Uh, and they come to Duke, I think, because they really mean it. And so those, those are the things that I would I'd say were really striking. It's a good thing you picked up the pace on day 14 <laughs> and thereafter. Uh, <laughs> let, let's, so let's flesh out a little of the picture. I mean, there's, there's so many parts. I mean, when he talks about getting people to cooperate, if you don't live in a university, you have no idea. I mean, this sounds a perfectly easy thing to accomplish, but it actually isn't easy. But your last hires that I can think of were in uh, the Nicholas School of the Environment, sure. the Sanford School of Public Policy, the Psychology Department, Sociology Department. They're really all over the place. And then, uh, but they form a natural whole for you. Let's talk about some of the stuff uh, you have going on. Uh, the last uh, uh, time I did one of these events, I did it in Houston about three weeks ago, and the person I interviewed was Shane Battier. Uh, you might be called the Shane Battier of global health. Uh, and one of the things that was interesting is Shane Battier is actually cooperating with the uh, Duke Global Health Program. Shane Battier explained he is uh, the, one of the best known iconic figures in China because he's the Michael Jordan associated with China's biggest shoe company. Uh, and so he has, the, you know, he has the ability to project to large audiences and you had an idea of how that could be used in terms of sort of health, edu health education. Right, and is Peter still here? Peter, yes. Actually, I, I was introduced to Shane through our trustee, uh, Peter Kahn, who's here. And, and, uh, and the background on this very briefly is that one of our priorities in, in our, we, we have six research priorities. One of them, and, and they deal with those issues which are not only big problems in global health now, but are gonna be bigger problems. And the one that really, one of the six that we have is, is obesity and cardiovascular disease. Some of you may say, well, that doesn't occur you know, in poorer countries. In fact, um, India has the highest rates of diabetes in the world right now. China has one of the highest rates of stroke. Uh, from, uh, and, and the whole the, the pandemic of obesity and, and tobacco is, is rampant now, particularly in Asia, but now even more and more in Latin America as well, even urban Africa. So one of our priorities is, are the, is chronic disease, particularly obesity and cardiovascular disease. And we've been very fortunate that in the last few, last few years, we've built up collaborations with a number of universities in China, particularly Peking University, Fudan University, 
uh, where there's a great interest in, in, in research in these areas. Uh, we, have a, we, we have a center of excellence at Peking University in cardiovascular disease. Um, we have a stroke research training center there. Um, there's a lot of stroke, in, in, particularly in China, because those of you who eat Chinese food, a lot of salt gets added in the wok, and, and uh, that leads to very high rates of high blood pressure and stroke, much higher than in this country. And so when, what, what obviously has to happen, in the way we think, is if you really want to make a difference, we've got to change people when they're young. It's the same in this country. We have a huge problem with obesity in, in young children in, in this country. We've got to make a difference in, their, in school years if we're going to really do something about the, this problem. And so what we're going to do is um, we had the idea that with our colleagues in Beijing, we would go into the Beijing schools and, and work, on some, work on a program there to improve, um, to improve diet. Um, and you know, unfortunately, one of the problems in China, you have a one-child family with more and more money, so a lot more food goes to that child. You have more McDonald's in Beijing than any city of the world. Uh, and all, with McDonald's comes all the other chains. So what we talked to Shane about is that would he come into the schools and, and ex emphasize uh, exercise, physical education, to the students, he can be there some of the time, but he can also use videos and be online with them and text messaging. So that's, the, that's one of the projects. But it's a good example of what, let's think about it one second. So that, that project involves faculty from psychology, uh, obviously. It involves faculty from the medical school uh, who are interested, of course, in, in, in health, particularly uh, in community and family medicine. And it involves uh, um, nutrition experts from one of our academic centers that deal with nutrition. So that's a project that brings three parts of Duke together that we've been able to bring together through the Institute. And we have a lot of examples like that. It's what we try to do, which is to say, OK, how can we take all the great talent at Duke uh, and, and address a, a global problem in an, in an important place? Well, let me pick another important place. And I'm strongly tempted, because uh, there's someone here who did her third year at Duke Medical School in Tanzania. That's right. And I could ask about that. Uh, people have asked about Haiti, and we'll have time to talk about all of this. But let me choose uh, one that sometimes doesn't come up. Uh, you know, I went to, there was a, a, a national meeting of university global health programs, and presidents from universities as well as directors went. Uh, and I was there, Mike and I were there in Bethesda. And a very interesting thing is, many global health programs treat global health as, it, as if it involves health in other countries. Uh, and one of the things that's always been part of our understanding is that global means this country, indeed one's own city. Uh, and so I'm very interested that your career, which eventually reached to Nepal and Bangladesh, began by talking about Brooklyn and East Baltimore. Uh, so maybe you could say something about how the local fits in global health. Sure. What, and, and, and both, uh, how does local make a part of it, but how does a global understanding of health change your understanding of local health? So two questions. I think first, um, unfortunately, you all know Durham and Eastern North Carolina. We, we've got plenty of health disparities in our backyard. And we always said from the outset that that would be part of what we did. And, and so as Dick says, there are projects that we have dealing with obesity, which is a major problem in Durham, particularly in African-American populations. Um, uh, we have a project being done through churches. We have a project one of our faculty is doing through community health centers. Um, dealing, trying to reach out to populations on, on proper, good diet and nutrition interventions. Um, the, the, we have a, um, you know, a reasonably uh, large HIV problem, so we have a number of very good HIV prevention projects. We have, as you know, a very important environmental initiative that, that Marilyn Miranda does, uh, where sure. we're, we're using GIS, uh, an information system to look at some of the problems in the environment in Durham. When we, we found through some very, she found through some very careful analysis where the, how the lead poisoning was occurring in, in Durham. We also have a project that was on the front page of the New York Times a few months ago in clergy, uh, actually in, in North Carolina, looking at the health of clergy. It turns out clergy really have health problems. And um, uh, we, we've been working with a number of the churches now trying to see if we can help improve the health of the clergy because they have a lot to do with people's health themselves and how they counsel them. They have a lot of depression, a lot of heart disease themselves. So we have a wide range of projects that are local. Now, the, the other part of your question, it really is interesting how you can see the local and, and global come together. There are lessons actually we can learn, we have learned about use of technology, for example, in a country like India that we can bring back, use of handheld PDAs, 
to collect data uh, that you can come back and try in Durham. You, you, there are, there are, it's very interesting to me how there are, um, maybe some of you would be surprised, but there are some important discoveries in treatment on HIV that have been able to, to be brought back uh, into Durham. We had in Moshi, one of, we, we worked on this pediatric diagnostic test, di diagnosing HIV in children, which we actually discovered better in, how to do this better in Moshi, and we bring it back to Durham. So the local and global are, are more and more mixed, and, the, and, and I think I've already alluded to this, but that the diseases that occur in the United States don't differ very much anymore from the diseases that occur in the rest of the world. Well, uh, uh, you know, one thing about you is, so, okay, so you're doing obesity and fitness and Shane Battier in China and clergy health and uh, diet in North Carolina. Uh, and so if anybody calls you and asks you to do something else, it would be easy to, for you to imagine you saying, how could you think I could do that? I'm too busy. Uh, but actually, anytime anything comes up uh, that creates the vaguest hint of an opportunity for global health on the Duke campus, you're just all over it. Uh, and so I mentioned before this phenomenon called the Winter Forum, where students come back before school starts for a couple day sort of mental exercise on some interesting problem. Uh, last year we did the green economy. This year we are going to stage a pandemic. Uh, and so, uh, and so, would you like to tell us a little bit about our state? You know, I, I remember, of course, I spent all, not last summer, but the summer before, uh, you know, all our meetings were getting ready for the famous flu, uh, right? Uh, but, you know, after all, that was, that was, that was fun because it didn't happen, but maybe another one would. So I, I can't give the punchline, but there, there, we are, we've actually um, simulated a, a worldwide pandemic well, we, we, well, first of all, I'll tell you the story, then I'll tell you what happened with students. So the story this year is, it, last year was on the green economy, but this, this is actually going to be a pandemic, which we've been working on for eight months. Uh, we're going to have someone calling in from China. The president's going to get involved on one of his trips. I'm going to be involved. I don't want to give away the plot because I don't want the students to know. But there's a, it's not just a pandemic. We're using these two and a half days to teach about how people respond to disease, rightly and wrongly, uh, about assumptions we make about disease, uh, about the way health authorities need to act about disease, the importance of thorough investigation before one draws assumptions about disease. So we're using the theme pandemic to bring out a lot of very interesting aspects of the way one looks at global health. And, um, and I'm just a little nervous that people are gonna really think there's a there's a pandemic, but we're, we're working on the media so that people don't think Duke has got a real health problem. Uh, uh, so <laughs> I will okay. say one other so, thing. I was going to say that we had 280 students sign up, and we only had 100 slots. There is a pandemic of enthusiasm for our <laughs> pandemic exercise. Uh, 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 they haven't told me what the scenario is, right? You can't tell anybody because <laughs> no, then they'll have been you. prepared. <laughs> the whole point of a health emergency is it has to be an emergency. Hey, Hardy. Uh, but I saw you. Uh, but uh, all I know is uh, last year I actually s had a party for all the people at the Winter Forum, and so I said I would again this time, and they said, well, you can't because in the scenario you're out of the country. Right. Right? Okay. Uh, and he's but, not allowed but, back see, in but the country. I'll tell you part of what interests me about this. You know that if there were a pandemic, medical treatment is actually almost the easiest part of it, right? Because then the whole question of like, how do you conceptualize different populations that are at risk? How do you, how, how do you rationalize uh, scarce resources at this time? And even, you know, one of the things that we know is very, is, is very important, which is the ethical issues that come up in a situation like that, where there's actual, you know, you may, not, you may wish there weren't choices, but there, where there would actually be choices. Uh, and so I'd like to think that a student coming to a school that has exercises like that would really, you know, have, have their sense of human reality by deepened and not, and, and be deepened and not just take classes. Uh, let me ask you maybe one or two questions and then I'll, be, then I'll be done. An interesting thing about global health in modern times is that money comes into it from a variety of sources. Um, I'm thinking, you know, we just got this $10 million grant uh, for uh, medical education in Tanzania that we'll be working with Tanzanian partners, and it's half funded by the government PEPFAR program and half by the Fogarty Institute, is this not right, of NIH. Right. Uh, so I was thinking of that, and then I'm thinking of all the places that involve 
involved the, uh, uh, the, the Gates Foundation, for instance. And so you have these funny new kinds of consortia of private foundations, uh, 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 government agencies, inter-international uh, inter governmental coalitions. Uh, what's your idea about how the model will evolve for the funding of, co of complex global health interventions? So I think what's happened is that so the fact that global health is a hot field in students, we've talked about, but it's also a hot field in other areas, and to, to take your question why, how the money has flown. Global health is seen as a real issue for security. We've sort of just talked about that, but the pandemics um, don't have borders, and so, so there, there are security issues. We also know that when, when countries are poor, there's more unrest. So, so the State Department has been, our State Department has really made global health a priority. Hillary Clinton gave a speech at Hopkins uh, a little while back about this. Um, and that's why you had President Bush's PEPFAR program. That's why you have President Obama's Global Health Initiative, because health is seen very much by our politicians as an issue of, of security. It's also seen as an issue of diplomacy. Countries that don't get along very well sometimes heal their differences to some extent uh, through health collaboration. Also in science, um, the scientific community is very interested in NIH. It's a fit, one of the top five priorities at NIH. One reason is that the average professor today in science and health, at least a third, 30 to 5 to 40 percent of the publications that they write are going to be written with a colleague from another country. Only to illustrate that a lot of what we do in, in, in science and medicine and health today involve collaborations of scientists, not just in your city or in your school, but in another country. The business world is very interested in global health. The global health uh, economy, if you like, is close to three, at least $3 trillion, if you think about drugs, vaccines, diagnostics. So for all of these reasons, you have more resources coming into global health through government, through foundations, Melinda, uh, and the Gates Foundation, that's because Bill and Melinda Gates personally are committed to reducing health disparities in the poorest countries of the world. That's their priority, and that's really a, a great attribute, is to make the poorest healthier. So you have, you have the Gates Foundation, you have government, you have business, uh, all playing a major role, in, and, and so there are a lot of resources now uh, that's trying to make a difference in reducing health disparities in the world, and I think someone who runs an institute, one has to try to figure out how to, you know, to both get the best dollars from NIH, because that's where your best science dollars come. Gates Foundation is interested in, 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 in programs. Uh, business is interested in, in everything from health sector management to, to drug trials to vaccine development. So all of those are, are real players, and a lot of what we do is try to work with all those players and make them feel Duke can deliver so we can get their support. So now I'll ask you a last, a last question, which is this. If we actually stop and try to think of the billions of people who live in the world and what the phenomenon of well-being is, and you know, in this country, we have a sort of evolved sense that health is almost like a human right, as you know, I mean, it's, it's not in the Constitution, but you know that if you are healthy, that, you know, that's, a, that's the foundation of everything else, the same as education, then, is a foundation of, every, of, of everything else. And yet we know that health is not the birthright of people around the world. Uh, uh, so now I guess I would ask you, you know, if you try to think of all the different places you can be and all the ways you could act, what can a university legitimately aspire to do in the face of the sheer massiveness of the health challenge of humanity? What can one university aspire right. to do? Well, what we've tried to do um, after a lot of consultation and thought is do a few things really well. Uh, one, of course, education. As a, I, I think our major role, is now, as I already said, is based on knowledge. And so we are trying to build a, a, a mix of educational programs from undergrad, undergraduate uh, to master's to doctoral program, postdoc, and then into the various programs in the schools, uh, particularly the medical school. We have a track now in the medical school. Our medical students uh, were very upset. You know, we know that one third of Duke medical students now say they come to Duke uh, because they want to do global health, which is, which is a lot of students. So first and foremost, we, we, we want to train future leaders and train people to 
both have the knowledge of global health, but also understand not just the diseases, as I earlier said, but also the determinants and, and, and the interventions that we can um, put in place to not only treat disease, but prevent disease. So education, there's no question that's a priority. And as you've mentioned, we're teaming up with a few other universities around the world who want to build global health programs. Why are we doing that? Well, as a global university, that gives us an opportunity to have student exchange. It gives opportunities for faculty exchange. So partnering with a number of, of universities around the world in educational programs is also something we're doing. Secondly, of course, I mentioned research. We've picked a, a few research areas that, we're, that are cutting edge and, and where Duke really has great strengths. We can't do it all. So, um, so cardiovascular disease I mentioned, global environmental health, uh, health system strengthening, um, aging. You know, aging is a great, um, a great challenge around the world. It's a nice challenge for people like me. The, the, the fastest growing group in the, in the world right now are octogenarians in terms of the, uh, people living into their 80s. Uh, in, a, in the 2015, there'll be more people living uh, um, uh, over age five than less than age five. So, so aging is, you may ask why we're looking at problems, health problems of the aged, because many countries are facing that acutely. China had a, a lifespan of 45 years, about you know, 40 years ago, now has a lifespan three years less than the US. So the whole challenge of the aging societies is, is another big priority for us. And then lastly, emerging infections. Why emerging infections? Well, one, we have a very good medical school, but also we have a medical school in Singapore. Uh, it's, it's called the Duke NUS Medical School. It's, been, it's now in its fourth year. Dick will be, President Broadhead will be going to the commencement, which is very exciting, uh, that we actually have a medical school in Asia. And that gives us great opportunities to work in Asia and to, to work around Asia, having a medical school with, on the campus of the National University of Singapore. And then lastly, what a, what a university can do is we are partnering with, I mentioned this already, with about a dozen universities around the world who we see as our partners in building our education programs, collaborating in research. Uh, and I think what's really important in today's world is to understand that a partner means an equal partner. And we learn from each other and we exchange uh, and, 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 and um, learn new knowledge and teach our students together. So it's a very exciting time at a university in bringing these things together. That's great. I mean, I have found this fantastically interesting. Uh, if you haven't, I'm sorry for you, but I'm glad for me. Uh, <laughs> it was great. So listen, the group is small enough that we will, you'll be able to ask questions to Mike upstairs, but let's have a few here and then we'll sort of dissolve and go on with the, go, go on with the party. Questions? You want to call? Uh, I, I, I see one here. You, you must understand that with the lights, we, <laughs> our chances of seeing you are uh, diminished. Hi, I'm Claire Snyder. Welcome to Baltimore. Thank you. Um, my postgraduate training is in public health, and it occurs to me that I couldn't have gotten that training at Duke. Um, in developing the Global Health Initiative, how do you see it within the whole context of public health? Is it the first step towards a school of public health or not? <laughs> well, your question is interesting on a couple of accounts. Because we don't have a public health school, this may seem a, a little contradictory, but it's not. Because we don't have a public health school, it's easier to have everybody feel part of it, to have all the schools feel part of it. Universities that have a public health school, sometimes public health schools want to own global health. But the exciting thing for us is that, as I've already indicated, I think if you went around and talked to the deans, they all feel part of the Global Health Institute. And you know, we feel part of them. Uh, recently, one of the deans of public policy, so we have, we had, President Broder was mentioning how many faculty, there are about 80 faculty now at Duke that work in global health at the, uh, and, are, and are part of our institute. The, um, the place, the school that has the most is public policy. So the dean recently called me up, he had this 13th faculty member, his thir he, had, he had his 13th faculty member that's a member of our institute, and he said, so now I'm wondering, are you running are you running uh, Sanford School of Public Policy or am I running the Global Health Institute? And I said, it's fine, we're both running both, that's fine. I mean, and, I mean he meant it very, in, in a very positive, humorous way, but I think that's the culture we're trying to create. So uh, really, the, the, the way we're approaching global health is that uh, medicine is part of it, but so are the rest of the, uh, the, the university. 
Whether we would ever become a school is, is certainly beyond my pay grade. Uh, I'm not sure that we need to become a school to be able to do what we're doing. And if we became a school, we might be a little bit more siloed. Mm -hmm. So by not being a school, in some ways, we're more able to involve all of the university. Yeah. Uh, I'm not saying there's a bad way or a good way. I'm just telling you how it's worked out. Let, let me say something else that will show my extreme nonpartisan nature. Uh, which is, you know, in Baltimore, we're in a place that has a fantastically famous and distinguished school of public health, and there is another one near us at UNC. Uh, and quite a number of Duke medical students who become interested in this do a public health, a Duke medical degree sure. and a public health degree at UNC. Uh, I think I, I actually am, am, am fine with that. Uh, yeah, sure. uh, 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 the, the fact that you can work together with people and get the benefit of the collaboration rather than feel that everybody has to uh, cre create their own. We need people with expertise in public health. In fact, I've recruited a lot of uh, UNC <laughs> graduates who have MPHs. We need public health uh, as part of, as one of the uh, professions to be involved in global health. Sure, sure. Please, sir. Dr. Burson, who are your students? What are their backgrounds? And what are they going to do when they finish your program? OK. Great, great question. It depends which students we talk about. But if we start, if we start with undergrads, so we have <coughs> We have a focus program, which is 30 students who are freshmen. Then we, as President Brody said, we have an undergraduate certificate. It's now the second largest certificate on campus. Uh, I think we have about 140 total students, about 60, 70 graduate a year. And it's interesting, um, well, and, and then I'll say we have a master's program, which we just started under the graduate school, a master's in global health. We're in our second class. We're starting small to ensure quality. We have 20 students. Uh, in a, right now in a class, we're going to go up to about 30 or 40. And what's interesting so far is that these students, including under, the undergraduates, are not having problems finding interesting jobs. Many of the undergrads are working in organizations that have, are, are, are either funded by the U.S. government, funded by the Gates Foundation, uh, funded by the private sector. Uh, we already talked about all the resources. That, that are, they're able, to, they're looking for young talent that have knowledge of global health and are energetic, want to go to the field and, and, and work in a particular area. Very often they'll self-train them or they'll train them in an area because they're undergrads. Our master students, of course, are, are a different breed. They have much more knowledge, much more in the way of skills. They're not having any problems getting jobs. Uh, uh, working um, in, in, very, in, in, in academic institutions, in the private sector, in government organizations, in the UN system. Um, this is a good time to have training in global health. Uh, I mean, it, if, of course, it, it, the, the, not everyone gets the job they want, but, and, and this is a good time. Many of them also go on to get medical degrees, law degrees, uh, public policy de uh, degrees, joint master's programs. Some go on to get PhDs. Um, so in actual fact, we're very fortunate right now that because of the resources that are available, that there are opportunities to work in various ways, either research, service, uh, um, uh, education, in global health. It's a, it's a good time. To, uh, we're very lucky. If there's one more, I'll take it, and then we can go party on, please. Hi, I'm M.K. Swan. I graduated in 1982. And you spoke a little bit about demographics. And I'm facing an issue now with my mother, who's 88. Do you have any comments for graduates about elder care? Because it seems that's going to just become a bigger issue as, as we all age. Thank you. Elder care, as I already intimated, is an issue not just in this country, but everywhere. And I'm struck. Um, I'm struck how poorly prepared we, we all are for this. I mean, I've dealt with my parents, and soon my child will deal with me. And, and there are critical decisions about care, uh, uh, whether to give care, not to give care, um, ethical issues, moral issues, spiritual issues. Um, and and that, I, I deliberately included this in the Global Health Institute because I feel there's a tremendous amount that we still have to learn. And even in this country, where we've had a pretty good lifespan now for a number of decades, we don't do it very well. 
Um, we, we keep people alive, in, in quotes, but you know, what is the quality of life? And I think these are really tough questions. Now, move over to, a, as already mentioned, move to India, move to China, where suddenly you have a huge growth. And, and, and here we've built up some infrastructure. We have assisted living, we have different kinds of structures, you know, we even nursing homes. But in, 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 in these middle income countries that have rapidly become uh, more wealthy and healthy and having longer lifespans, there's nothing. Uh, and, and the crisis that they're facing is a real crisis. So I, I think this is a real priority. I, you know, I think even in our medical schools, we haven't done a very good job of teaching this. I mean, there's more sensitivity to it now and there's more awareness of it now and I think things are getting better. But the, 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 the real questions, are, the interesting part of this is the questions are not just medical questions. They're much broader and we need to, to think of the family and we need to think of the, 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 the wider uh, dimension of dying, which is not easy to talk about. So, you know, but it's a worldwide issue and one that um, I think is going to get more and more attention. Well, that maybe isn't the very sentence I would have chosen to end on. Uh, uh, well, except after all, I mean, if you're talking gl global health, you're talking about just these things. Uh, I would say, I think you get a sense for, with an hour with this guy, uh, how exciting it is uh, and how deeply gratifying to be the colleague of a person like Mike Merson, who brings a life of Thank knowledge, you. a life of expertise, and a life of just sort of human uh, connection with the issue of human well-being uh, uh, to the inspiration of students for the future. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.